been asked to be a part of a really amazing outreach experience where we can do an egg drop for the kids and join with Imagine Church in what they're doing. And we want you to have an opportunity to be a part of that. And we have some blue cards that are around you on in the seats. And if the ushers could make sure that there's pencils given and that the blue cards are distributed, I would really greatly appreciate that, ushers. So if you would bring those cards, if you would put your hand up, we'll make sure you get a card. Um, but we would love for you to go ahead and sign up for that experience. It's going to be a great way for us to penetrate our community and serve kids. Last year they had like 800 people, kids that were served through that experience. This year they're hoping to do 1,600, and so they're asking area churches to participate. So as we listen to the bells, go ahead and sign up on those cards, and the ushers or I can hand out a blue card for you just by putting up your hand. Thank you. We do have quite a number of experiences going on that you'll find in your bulletin. One of them that is not yet in the bulletin that I want to share with you is that we have two mini retreats coming up in March, starting on the 11th and the 18th for the youth, the older youth, and we're basically trying to prepare our youth for college and have them have a thoroughly Christian worldview by the time they go off, all in two weeks. <laughs> But no, you've been doing this all your lives, parents, I'm sure, all their lives. But we want to help you with that. And Jill, and Jill is going to be basically leading the charge on that particular curriculum. So keep that in mind, the 11th and the 18th. And then 
We also want to just remind you that tomorrow night we are having at 6.30 a Refreshments with the Pastors time, and if you are interested in learning more about the church, we would love to have you be a part of that. We'd love to get to know you better through that experience. And then at 7.30, all of our facilitators and small groups of the story, these are the adult-led groups, the adult groups for adults. <laughs> we want you to come to that meeting because we have a lot of children's groups as well. So, having said that, we shall start off with prayer. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, we, we are so grateful to you for the way you show up. You are always there. You are with us. We have so many promises to hold on to and that you want to be our guide, our friend, our protector. And we're so glad that you are. Help us to experience you here in this worship service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's sing, Come the Long Expected Jesus.
Savior we have. Isn't that the truth? We have so much to celebrate that Jesus at just the right time was sent into the world. He stepped down into the darkness so that he could be our light. And we can be the children of light and we can celebrate that every Sunday, every day, Christmas or no, <laughs> we can celebrate that great truth. Hallelujah. Let's worship him.
Dear Heavenly Father, everything in heaven and earth comes from you. Lord, we give you only what is already yours. Please multiply these gifts to further your kingdom here in Westfield and beyond. May your name be praised forever and ever. Amen. All right. Good morning. Well, you have all in Sunday school classes over the last couple of weeks, actually last several weeks, and everyone in here, we've been hearing a lot about kings, right? A lot of kings. Now, there are some kings that were not so good, like Jeroboam and a whole bunch of others. It was kind of like back and forth for a while there. Good king, bad king, good king, bad king, good king, bad king. Have you guys ever seen Horton? Here's a who where he goes through the pictures and says, great grandfather, great grandfather, great grandfather, not so great grandfather, great grandfather, right? <laughs> okay, that was kind of like the kings in the Bible, right? Some were good, some were bad. Who can tell me a good king that you think of, though? Okay, ah, man, you ruined my whole children's sermon, William Crow. <laughs> no. you, didn't, you didn't ruin it, you just got to my point a little earlier, but that's okay, that is very good, you're right, because Jesus is actually... King David. King David, yes, yes, King David was a great king, and you are exactly right, though, William Crumb. Jesus is the greatest king ever, right? Yep, okay, who else can think of some kings? What about a king that was very wise, that was known for his wisdom? You know? You know, Kale? Solomon. Yes, King Solomon. He was known to be wise. So we've got bad kings, we've got good kings. And you know what? We've got the greatest king of all, Jesus, like William Crumb said. In fact, I'm glad you said that, William, because I will go ahead and just read that verse right now for us. In Luke, when the angel comes to Mary, the angel says, he, talking about Jesus, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. So right there in the Bible, we have that Jesus was a king. Now, Jesus was an, an earthly king like we think of that sits on a throne and has a scepter, right? Because he has a heavenly kingdom. Um, but he was a king in the sense that he's over everything. He protects everybody. He takes care of things, right? And so that's one of the things the king did. Now, what I was getting to, though, when we're talking about kings, you know, we had bad kings, good kings, wise king, the greatest king, Jesus. Then there were some kings that were just kind of crazy, right? <laughs> like Nebuchadnezzar, hey, I don't like you today, so you get to go in the fiery furnace. And I'm going to heat it up so hot that the soldiers throwing you in there are going to die too. Okay, so some kings that just on a whim would be like, you're out of there. I didn't want to see you today. So guess what? You get to go to the lions, right? Can you guys think of a story that we just studied real recently about a king like that? A king, there was a woman. She had to be very careful. She had to do something very brave because of this policy of a king. Do you remember that? Esther. Very good. Yeah, Esther had to ask her husband, who was a very powerful king, King Xerxes, if he would save her people, the Jewish people. But... There was a rule that that king had. If anyone went before that king, they would be killed immediately unless the king held out what was a scepter or his staff. Okay? So the really cool thing, though, is that Jesus is the greatest king. But guess what? We don't have to wait for Jesus to put out a scepter. You don't ever have to be afraid that if you go before Jesus and ask him for help or pray for someone or just say, Jesus, I really need you right now. You can do that any time. You don't have to ask Jesus first because Jesus always has a scepter out. He's never going to do anything mean to you because you talk to him. Okay? And so I want you guys to remember that. And to help you remember that, I will hand, let you these be handed out at children's worship. But I have pencils, okay? Kind of pretend this is a scepter that's being brought forward to you. So when you use these pencils... I want you to remember that you can always go to Jesus, right? And he forgives our sins. And all we have to do is accept him. We don't have to ask his permission. We just have to say, Jesus, I believe in you. Please forgive me for my sins. Yes, Kat. Kaylee. Okay, I will give you one as we're walking back, okay? All right. Good question. You too. Okay. All right, so if you guys will bow your heads now, we'll say a prayer, and then you can, we'll dismiss for Children's Church. 
Dear Lord, we thank you that you sent your son to save us from our sins, to forgive us. We thank you that you are a loving God, and we don't have to ask permission before we come before you, that your throne of grace is always open, and we can simply come and ask. And we thank you for your love. Help us to love others. Amen. Wanted to give you, a, on behalf of the staff parish committee and our ad board, wanted to give you a quick update on some staffing updates in our, uh, in our church office. As you know, um, as you may or may not know, uh, Carla, our previous administrative assistant, resigned due to some health concerns and also some other priorities in her life of uh, also babysitting some of her grandkids. So uh, it really was an opportunity for us to kind of take uh, take step back and kind of look at our, our staff and every uh, everything that we have on our plate from a ministry standpoint. And I'm very pleased to announce uh, on behalf of the staff parish that uh, Peggy Fulton and Tony Dickover are going to be uh, kind of a tag team on our administrative position. Um, Peggy will be in the office Monday and Wednesday. Tony on Tuesday, and uh, Tony's going to be doing a double duty. She also serves as our financial secretary as well. And also I'd like to highlight many volunteers that also uh, come into the office to uh, fold bulletins, to do inserts, anything that uh, we feel that needs to be done. So I know Agatha has been very active in the, in the office. Any other volunteers that I don't want to miss anybody? So, what's that? And others? <laughs> yes, so I apologize. I, I don't want to miss anyone, but uh, definitely between Peggy and Tony and our, our many volunteers, uh, they keep our office running well. And also, as we looked at everything that was on our plate from a ministry standpoint, we've, uh, we've learned that... Uh, that we need some additional support and Pastor Laura has graciously offered to serve some more hours and also to serve our many ministry needs. So just wanted to give you a quick update with that and if, if you have any questions feel free to reach out to me or uh, Bruce Searle and we'll definitely answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Good morning. So um, this weekend, Saturday, is our ninth annual Spencer Lancaster Chili Dinner, and that's to raise money for um, Relay for Life, American Cancer Society. And then later on this summer, we'll have Relay for Life. But um, there's a sign-up sheet for donations of food and donations of time out on the, um, in the gathering place. We'd love if you'd take a look at that. All the details are in your bulletin. But I've been asked to talk about why <laughs> Relay is so important to me, and why the chili dinner is so important. Because you know, I'm a cancer survivor as well, and um, what you may not know is the type of cancer I had was, one of them was called, I was HER2 new po positive. And about eight years before I was diagnosed, which I was diagnosed at the end of 2013, 13, there was no cure for HER2 new positive cancer. Um, you had less than a year to get your life in order, and that was that. But because of the wonderful donations and people supporting the chili dinner and Relay for Life with their time and their gifts and just being the hands of God during, this, during these events, I'm here today. So just remember that every little thing we do can impact someone's life greatly. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, just, uh, Kelly, since you shared, uh, Byron and Gail are back in the congregation with us today. Well, we allowed them back in since they've been in Arizona for so long. So it's good to see you guys back. But uh, about the chili dinner, this they said uh, last year uh, a tiny speck was discovered during Gail's routine mammogram, and then they went out to Arizona and stayed, um, and then the speck was cancerous and then was removed, and then the biopsy showed the tissue, showed the cancer had the potential of spreading, so there was a second procedure uh, that it, uh, uh, to show that it had not spread to the lymph nodes. And after five days of localized radiation treatment with continual daily medication, probability of reoccurrence has been reduced to 2%. So, 
So anyway, they said that it was God's will that we were directed to a skilled and caring surgeons, oncologists, radiations, technician, and support staff that allowed us to get over this bump in the road, and they wanted to share about her healing today. So, hey, good to see you back, and uh, thank God for your healing. And, you know, these other people are on the healing team, too, you know, the doctors and the nurses and the radiation people and the technicians, and we need to give uh, thanks to God for that as well. So um, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, who on the first day of the week created light out of darkness, we thank you that you brought us to see the light of another day and that you've blessed us with the ability to come to your house and worship today, to hear your word. So clear the darkness of sin from our hearts and enlighten our understanding and quicken our spirits and create in us a spirit to praise you and to worship you. And may your name and your light shine before all people through us. And blessed Savior, who on the first day of the week rose from the grave as our Redeemer from sin, help us with repentant faith to accept your forgiveness and to rise daily from sin to serve you in newness of life. And Holy Spirit, who on the first day of the week descended on your church with blessing and power, bless us with your spiritual healing today. And give us strength to speak of the things that we have seen and heard. Holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, grant us uh, the ability to hear your word. And may it be preached and taught with power. And preserve us as hearers from distracting thoughts and cares. Enable us with open mind and ready heart to receive your truth. And to order our lives according to your word and will. For Jesus' sake. Be with all those on our healing prayer list today. Be with Pat Prosser's son who went through surgery. And we pray now the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, scripture reading today is from John uh, chapter 1 verses 1 through 14 
And if you're able, would you please rise? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was, which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Well, how many of you, when you were kids, uh, were so excited on Christmas Eve that you couldn't even hardly stand it? You couldn't even hardly get to sleep at night because Christmas was the next day. And I, I, I was like that. When I got older, I kind of got over that. And, uh, but then we started having a... Uh, midnight worship services on Christmas Eve, and that was great, except now I got kids that want to wake me up at six in the morning, because we got to get out of here and get the presents, you know, and one of the salient features of the Old Testament is its growing expectation of the coming Messiah, and it immediately began after the fall. No sooner had Adam and Eve sinned than God announced his intention to save sinners, and to do so, through a descendant of the very person by whom sin had entered the world. Now, when did the plan of salvation begin? Well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's from the foundation of the world. But we first see it prophesied in the Old Testament. In, in Genesis 3.15 is the first prophecy of a coming Messiah. Genesis 3.15. If we can bring that up. Um, uh, you want to read that with me? And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And what we see here is the head of the serpent, the enemy, the devil, is going to be crushed, that is destroyed, by the coming Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And at the, at the time, the victor will not altogether escape injury, because he will suffer bruising to the heel. So the promise to Eve that one of her descendants would ultimately crush the serpent's head is often and rightly called the Proto-Evangelium. That's a big word. It means the first proclamation of the gospel. And uh, it was, of course, fulfilled on the cross. For it was there that the devil disarmed and overthrew uh, the devil, was overthrown, but at cost to the Messiah's suffering. And so we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and his suffering on the cross. But God's peace allows no appeasement of the devil. Indeed, it's only through the destruction of evil that peace can be attained. So from then on, the promises of the Messiah from the Old Testament, they get interesting because that the Messiah would be of the seed of the woman. Everybody else, the seed of the man. Be the seed of the woman and would be a descendant of Abraham through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed that he would be a king like David that he would be a prophet like Moses a king like David a priest like Melchizedek that he would be uh, like John Calvin said the three offices he would have are prophet priest and king he speaks God's word. He intercedes for us before God. And he is sovereign ruler. And then he would be the servant of the Lord. The son of God. The son of man. The son of God. And then we come now to the culmination of the Old Testament. 
The prophets have been talking about it for years and years, namely the nativity, the birth of Jesus the Messiah. And it's told especially by Matthew and Luke. And in these early gospel accounts, we're struck by they're steeped in Old Testament language and culture. They're also accompanied by the miraculous. And we don't need to be embarrassed by this. It's surely fitting that a supernatural person would come into the world in a supernatural way. And so if we believe in the incarnation, it is logical also to believe in the virgin conception and the virgin birth. Now, uh, we start out with Luke 1, 26 and 27. And uh, says this, In the sixth month, want to read that with me? In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, and of, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Uh, and so after 400 years of silence, the close of the Old Testament, there's 400 years of silence. But God breaks the silence, but not through a prophet, but through an angel. And uh, the message Gabriel brought to Nazareth all but overwhelmed Mary. I mean, she's going to become a mother, but she's still unmarried. And she's a virgin. And you're going to name him Jesus, which means he has a saving mission. And that he would be great. He would be the son of the Most High. Be the son of God. It's a messianic title. And that he would reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will have no end. His son, Savior, Son, and King were his three titles. And Mary was greatly troubled. She's even mystified. What's the angel going to say to her? He says to her, uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. For nothing is impossible with God. Anybody who has God, Lord Jesus Christ, always has hope because nothing is impossible with God. Now, after all this, after Mary accepts uh, everything, uh, she sings a song. And Luke 1, 46 to 48 is a... Uh, beginning to that. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. And for um, at least the sixth century, the church has cherished Mary's song and included it in its liturgies called the Magnificent. And how can we sing her song? I mean, surely what happened to her left her in wonder and amazement, and she's greatly honored to be the mother of the Son of God. But it's, it's been recognized down through the ages that Mary's experience was absolutely unique. But on the other hand, it's typical of the experience of every Christian believer. God has also lavished His grace upon us. And so, as Mary says, his mercy extends from generation to generation to those who fear him. And Mary's song turns human values upside down. She talks about things like God dethrones the mighty and exalts the humble. And we've seen that. God dethrones Pharaoh. God dethrones Nebuchadnezzar. And yet he rescues Israel from exile. And he does that today in our experience of salvation. If we will dethrone ourselves and get on our knees and say with the publican, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And when we do that, God accepts us in His grace. But if we're going to be on the throne, say, I'm a, I'm a really good person. Who's God? Think? You know, today I was reading about people, back in the old days, people used to think for natural disasters, they needed to fast and repent and get right before God. Today, today people think God's not doing a very good job of handling natural disasters. <laughs> That's the whole mindset today. But if we dethrone ourselves, say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Like the, like the, 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 the prodigal son, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me a servant. He says, nothing doing. I'm putting the ring back on your finger. I'm putting the shoes on your feet. I'm putting the robe on you. And totally restores us. It's amazing. And God dismisses the rich and feeds the hungry. Mary was hungry. She knew from the Old Testament that one day God was going to bring his kingdom. And she was hungry for that kingdom. And hunger is still an indispensable condition of spiritual blessing. And self-satisfaction and complacency is its greatest enemy. So Mary was humble 
and she was also hungry. Maybe we need to be that way as well. Well, here's the big miracle, the virgin conception. Luke 1.35, the virgin birth. Want to read that with me? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, the virgin birth is a misleading expression, suggesting there was something unusual about Jesus' birth. But Jesus' birth was entirely normal and natural. It was His conception. That was indeed supernatural. For he was conceived by the operation of the Holy Spirit without the cooperation of a human father. Now Matthew and Luke make unambiguous affirmation that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. And, and uh, the two evangelists record both say he was born of the Virgin. And we move on from the historicity of the Virgin birth to its significance. Does it matter? It does. The angel's annunciation was in two stages. The first stressed the continuity with Mary's child would enjoy with the past. Because she would bear him, he would inherit the throne of his father David. And he would inherit from his mother both his humanity and his right to the messianic title. In the messianic kingdom. The second stressed the discontinuity between the child and the past because the Holy Spirit would come upon Mary and God's creative power would overshadow her so that her child would be unique, sinless, the Holy One, the Son of God. And in this way, what was announced to the Virgin Mary was her son's humanity and messiahship derived from her while his sinlessness and deity would be derived from the Holy Spirit. And as a result of the virgin conception, the virgin birth, Jesus Christ was simultaneously Mary's son and God's son, human and divine, the son of man, the son of God. And then we see Mary's submission, Luke 1.38. Uh, want to read that with me? I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. Now it's interesting, the fact about the birth of Jesus is that it occurred out of wedlock. Now there were all kind of rumors, what's going on with Mary? Yeah, what about Mary and Joseph? Remember, even Joseph had to have an angelic visitation to convince him to marry her that this was from the Holy Spirit. So these rumors persisted throughout Jesus' life and even beyond his death. And uh, one time Jesus was in a disagreement with the Pharisees who were, you know, and Jesus said, they were saying, we're Abraham's children. He said, Abraham, we're not your father, but you're of your father, the devil, because you do the stuff the devil does. Well, you know what they came back with? They came back with, with this retort. We were not illegitimate children. We were not born of fornication. You couldn't have said anything to insult Jesus more than to say that. But the interesting thing about as distasteful as these uh, rumors were and the gossip, it's cooperative evidence of the virgin birth. Mary's response to the angelic announcement wins our immediate admiration. I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And so she expresses her total willingness to be the virgin mother of the Son of God. In one sense, it was an amazing privilege. The mighty one has done great things for me. But it was also an awesome and costly responsibility. It involved a readiness to become pregnant before she was married. And to expose herself to shame and suffering and all the kind of names that people would call her. Not believing what happened to her. To me, the humility and courage of Mary in submitting to the virgin conception and virgin birth is, is really amazing. She surrendered her reputation to God and His will. And for us, too, what matters is that we allow God to be God and to do things His way, even if it means that uh, we risk losing our good name, like Mary may have. And then, well, eventually it's time for the baby to be born. Luke 2, 7. Luke 2, 7. Want to read that with me? And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and she wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, interesting thing in the providence of God. Caesar Augustus goes, I need more money. Instead of cutting taxes, what are we going to do? 
we're going to raise taxes. So he goes, uh, take a census. And now he makes all these people do all these uncomfortable things like go back to the, the place where their ancestors were to register. But it causes Mary and Joseph to take a journey from Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem. I'm sure, the, I'm sure her obstetrician wasn't too hot on that. You know, you got to go from there <laughs> pretty, you know, uh, pregnant and everything. And, and, uh, but it was the fulfillment of prophecy in the Old Testament. Micah 5.2 says that he would be born in Bethlehem. So Caesar was used by God, even though he didn't know it. And then they're probably, oh, finally, we've arrived in Bethlehem at this long journey. Guess what? The town's overcrowded. There's no room for them at the end. I got called the other day. My cousin, my nephews were playing basketball over at the Grand Park. Hey, there's no room in the parking over there either. Have you ever been over there during those days? Bad planning. <laughs> so, I mean, you can't believe all these cars over there for uh, all this stuff. But anyway, um, I'm sure they're doing well. But uh, anyway, um, lost my place. Um, so the innkeeper, he can't find a place for him. So the only place they can find is a stable. And Mary, when Mary's baby's born, she lays him in a manger, which is a feeding trough for animals. And it's symbolic of the rejection that later Jesus would experience. And so the emperor's edict brought Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem in the fulfillment of prophecy. And the innkeeper, by reason of overcrowding in the town, ensured that the Savior of the world was born appropriately, not in a palace, but in a stable. Not in splendor, but in obscurity and poverty. And surely Jesus can identify with the whole human race. And then we have the shepherds, Luke 2, 8 to 11. Uh, remember this? And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. Whenever angel shows up, people get scared. Uh, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So, the shepherds were the, they were the have-nots. And they were, you know, not well-educated. You know, and, um, and uh, but they were the first ones that the angels appeared to, to give the good news. So what'd they do? They went to check it out. They went to check it out. They had an open mind. They went over and to see for themselves. And when they did see Jesus, they spread the word. They could not keep the good news to themselves. And they returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard. What resulted was worship and witness. They worshiped God and they witnessed for God. They had been changed by seeing Jesus. And they were filled with the spirit of wonder and a spirit of worship. And the discovery of Jesus is still a transforming experience. It adds a new dimension to our old lifestyle. As Billy Graham used to say, it puts a new light in our eyes and a new spring in our step when we discover Jesus. And then, Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. God sent Jesus into the world at the right time. At the ripe time. And uh, there's been uh, a lot of speculation in regard to the socio-political situation at the time. And uh, the first one is, was called the Pax Romana. And that basically means that Rome ruled the world. And because they ruled the world, it brought some positive things, like their soldiers were everywhere. They pr protected travelers from bandits on land and pirates by sea. You know, uh, some of the reason we have free trade throughout the world. I had a lawyer in my last congregation, and he was reading this book, and he said, you know our navies patrol the oceans, you know, and keep trade going between all these countries and everything? I didn't know that. I mean, I knew some of it, but anyway... Um, but that's what they did. Also, the Greek language was common throughout the empire. And uh, it was immensely helpful to evangelism. The, old, the, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek, and it was called the Septuagint. And they could, they could read from that and share the gospel. Thirdly, there was widespread spiritual hunger. There was spiritual longings in the hearts of the people. The old mystery religions weren't doing it anymore. There were God-fearers on the edge of the sanctuaries of the Jewish synagogues because they were attracted by the monotheism and the high ethical standards. And this is who Paul preached the gospel to uh, often. So it was during a period after Jesus' resurrection 
um, and after uh, Paul's conversion, that in 10 years, Paul saw the church established in four major Roman provinces, Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, and Asia. And he said, so from Jerusalem all the way to Elicrum, I have proclaimed the gospel of Christ. The world was ripe for world evangelization. Whenever we speak of the coming of Christ or Christmas, we have in mind this epic-making event by which God, the eternal Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, became a human being in Jesus Christ. And we saw how the shepherds responded. Now let's see how some of the other people responded. For example, let's look at the Magi. Matthew 2.2. 2. These Magi, wise men from the east, came and want to read what they said and asked... Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. So uh, uh, January 6th is uh, what we call Epiphany. Do anybody know what Epiphany means? It means the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. Anybody in here a Gentile? If you're not a Jew, guess what you are? A Gentile. <laughs> so this is good news. The Eastern Orthodox Church celebrates this day as their Christmas day. And the Magi seem to have been astrologer priests from the, from the Persian Empire. And they're beautifully complementary to the shepherds. And the two groups couldn't have been more different. Racially, the shepherds were Jews. The Magi were Gentiles. Intellectually, the shepherds were, simp were simple and uneducated. The Magi were, were Gentile. They were uh, intellectuals. And scholars and wise men from the East. Socially, the shepherds belong to the world's have-nots. Obviously, the Magi, with their very expensive gifts, must have been very wealthy. Yet, despite these barriers, the Magi were united with the shepherds in their worship of the Lord Jesus. As are millions of Gentiles who've worshipped Jesus since then. You see, as we look at other religions of the world... Almost all of them are evident that other religions are ethnic and limited to a particular people and culture, while Christianity is not. Nearly 80% of the world's Christians today are non-white and non-Western. Uh, Christianity is emphatically not a white man's religion. My son, just this January, was worshiping with the Ethiopian church in Africa. Some of you worshiped with the Africans in Liberia. I was able to worship in the villages of India and in the huts of Haiti. And some have worshiped with the Inuit in the Arctic tundra. And thousands of Koreans worship in their mega churches. They have a different culture. In, uh, in, uh, in Korea. And the Latin South Americans with their Spanish guitars. And it is a universal appeal of Jesus, irrespective of ethnicity. It brought the shepherds from the field. It brought the wise men from the east. It still acts like a magnet. It attracts people of all cultures. And it's one of the most convincing evidences that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Well, now let's look at Herod. Matthew 2.13 uh, says, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Now, the Romans had put Herod on the throne. And, um, he, uh, and, and because he ruled this area, he called him the king of the Jews. Now, um, he was a foreigner. His father was an Edomite, and his mother was an Arabian princess. So he had no Jewish right to the throne. So the Jews hated that title for this guy. But uh, uh, Herod's throne was very insecure, and he lived in terror of rivals. And once he saw a rival, he promptly liquidated them. He killed his wife. He killed his mother, Alexandra. He killed his three sons. And he killed more than half the members of the Sanhedrin, many uncles, cousins, and relatives. It's not surprising that the Jewish historian Joseph, Joseph called him a pitiless monster. And, and Augustus Caesar even said it was safer to be Herod's pig than his son. In our language, he suffered from paranoia. <laughs> And the Magi arrived and said, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? We've come to worship him. Herod goes, what? I'm the king of the Jews. Who is this imposter? And so he's going to go try to kill uh, the lad and killed many 
uh, children uh, in trying to do that. And so an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, take the child and his mother to Egypt. And so uh, there's something very touching about the Son of God becoming a refugee baby and identifying himself with the dispossessed people of the world. And Matthew detects something else. He sees the flight into Egypt as a fulfillment of Scripture. It says, So was fulfilled what the Lord said through the prophet Hosea, Out of Egypt I have called my son. And Matthew sees in the story of Jesus a recapitulation of the history of Israel. You see, as Israel was oppressed in Egypt under the despotic ruler Pharaoh, so Jesus became a refugee in Egypt under the despotic rule of Herod. As Israel passed through the waters of the Red Sea, so Jesus passes through the waters of John's baptism in the Jordan River. As Israel was tested in the wilderness of Zin for 40 years, Jesus was tested in the wilderness for 40 days. And as Moses from Mount Sinai gave the law, so Jesus from the Mount of the Beatitudes gave his disciples the true interpretation and amplification of the law in the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever given. And so it's to marvel at the providence of God and the repetition of this pattern. And then we have another guy. His name was Simeon. Uh, Luke 2, verse 30 and 32. For my eyes have seen your salvation, and a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. A godly old man named Simeon, he was eagerly awaiting for the Messiah. The Holy Spirit had told him, you won't die until you see the Messiah. So he goes to the temple. He just happens to go to the temple one day, right at the time Joseph and Mary bring in their eight-day-old boy. And this is a, Simeon had the spiritual discernment to recognize Jesus. And he held him up and said, You can let me die now, Lord, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And we're not ready to die until we too can take Jesus and say, My eyes have seen your salvation. I receive this child as my Savior and the leader of my life. And then what does Paul say about Christ coming? What's the purpose of Christ coming? 1 Timothy 1.15. Want to read that with me? Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. <laughs> Anybody say, I'm worse than Paul. <laughs> Paul said, I'm I persecuted the church of God, you know. And uh, he said this is a reliable, universal, historical, liberating truth. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And it's personal, of whom I am the worst. And Jesus died for me. And until we can say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. And I accept what you did for me then we're not saved yet. We have to be able to do that. We have to make it personal. It can't just remain up here. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me, for my sins. Now help me to be the kind of person you want me to be. And then what did John say? 1 John 4, 14 said this. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. The world is John's term for godless society, which is displeasing to God and under His just judgment. And Savior indicates that the world needs salvation. And so salvation is freedom from guilt, judgment, self-centeredness, fear, and death. And the Son is the Savior we need because He's both God and man whose birth we celebrate at Christmas and whose death is the only ground on which God can forgive our sins today. And this is what he said, God sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So the father took the initiative in his great love in giving us his son. And in giving us his son, he gave us himself. And then 1 John 3, 5. Want to read that with me? But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So what will motivate us to forsake sin and to pursue righteousness? John is clear. He says it's to remember the purpose of Christ's appearing. That you know he appeared so that he might take away our sins. 
And he goes on to say the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So our response to Christ's coming is to live a life that's fully compatible with the reason he appeared on earth to take away our sins. And then um, we come to the infancy of Jesus. Luke 2.22 But when the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And uh, Jesus was, anybody know how old Jesus was when he was circumcised? Eight days, on the eighth day, that's right. Do you know the clotting mechanism in the body begins at eight, eight days? I guess that's a good thing. Uh, so he was, uh, he was named uh, in, in the blood. Okay, so anyway, uh, Jesus means God is Savior, and Jesus was presented to the Lord in the temple in Jerusalem. And so he was circumcised, he was named, and he was presented. And all these have to do with his mission. His circumcision portrayed him as a son of Abraham and a true member of the covenant community of God. And then his name proclaimed means he's the heaven-sent Savior of sinners. And then his presentation to God means that he was devoted to God's service and he's ready to do his will. And then we come to the boy in the temple. And um, Luke 2.49. Luke 2.49. Want to read that with me? Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Now how would you feel? You've been looking for your kid for three days. Where have you been? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's? Get in the car. <laughs> yeah. um, now, this is the only incident we know about in Jesus' boyhood, and it's highly significant of how he got lost in the temple. They, they had to come down for these festivals, and um, maybe it's a several-day journey by caravan. They're probably coming with family and neighbors and friends. And they go down for the Passover. Now they're going back home. Mary thinks he's with Jesus. I mean, Joseph thinks he's with Mary. Mary thinks he's with Joseph. When they, when they get so far down the road, where's Jesus? I thought he was with you. Where's Jesus? I thought he was with you. And then Mary and Joseph had to go to marriage counseling. <laughs> and I, I, I happen to know that that's probably what happened. And, uh, uh, and um, so they have to make the trek back, and they find Jesus in the temple. He's sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And his hearers were amazed at his understanding, and they were astonished. And the verbs used that when people were in Jesus' presence, they felt a sense of awe, even at age 12. He's going to be bar mitzvahed the next year. That means that he's, he's fully regarded as an adult to be responsible before God. Now, especially striking is the first word spoken by the Messiah. And notice he says, first he says, he calls God his father and the temple his father's house. And he corrects his mother. How many 12-year-olds correct their mother? Probably a lot. But anyway, anyway, he corrects his mother and he said, and he, and, uh, he said your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. But Jesus already is conscious of a special relationship with God the Father. And so secondly, Jesus expressed his compulsion. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? So he's aware of his mission as revealed in Scripture, and the Scriptures must be fulfilled. And then a couple of uh, things here um, before we end. Um, remember we said we, had to, we have to take Jesus into our own hearts? Now I've got to tell you this. Uh, this is weird, but uh, yesterday... Uh, I had an opportunity to take a free yoga class, so I did. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and and now I'm a little bit leery of yoga because it kind of comes out of, of Hindu practice. And uh, if it's stretching exercises and exercises, that's okay. But if you get into some of the weird spiritual stuff, you got to be careful. But um, the lady asked me after the class what I thought of it. I said, "Well, I said very relaxing music, very unrelaxing position." <laughs> And, I mean, I, my, my hamstrings are pretty, pretty uh, loose because I used to run the hurdles, but I, I cannot do this stuff, you know. And stand on one foot's hard, too. But anyway, we got to the end of the session, and she's saying stuff like, um, 
you know, now focus in. It's okay to calm your mind down and everything, but she said, now there's this door. There's this door, and I encourage you to open that door. And I'm going, you better be careful who you open that door to because there is a door to our heart. And Jesus said, I st behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. See, there are other spirits we don't want to open that door to. The scripture says, guard your heart, for from it flow the springs of life. And so when you invite Christ into your heart, you've got a new spring. You have a new spring there, you know. So I invite you, as we learn about Jesus today, for you to open that door for him to come in. Because he won't bash the door down, but he will come in if you invite him in. He's a gentleman. He won't bash the door down. Like the old painting, Jesus standing outside, there's no, there's no handle on the outside. It has to be opened from within. So I encourage you, there is a door to your heart. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open that door, I will come in. And you can say to him, well, Jesus, come on in. We had somebody in our Alpha course. Uh, she wasn't sure she believed. She started to take our membership class. And she goes, I'm not sure I believe. But by the fourth session, she said she had a, a vision of Jesus knocking at the door. And she had been going, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. But by the end of the fourth class, she said, well, why don't you come on in? And we noticed a change in her she had new light in her eyes and a new spring in her step. Well, let me close by the hidden years of Jesus. The hidden years, baby to 12 years old. And here's the scripture for that one. Luke 2, 40. Luke 2, 40. You want to read that with me? And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And then from 12 to 30, 18 years, we have... Luke 2.52. Want to read that with me? And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So here is Jesus growing physically, mentally, spiritually, socially. And um, his body developed naturally. His mind expanded as he learned his lessons at home and at school. He grew in grace and became ever more pleasing to God and his neighbor. And the people raise this objection. If Jesus grew in these areas, doesn't that mean that he was imperfect? Well, no, we're not claiming that Jesus jumped from infancy to adulthood with no growth in between, but that he grew and that at each stage he was perfect for that stage. For example, to say that he grew in favor with God doesn't mean that he was previously out of favor with God, but that at each stage he pleased God in accordance with his age. And so to insist on this growth is to guarantee the authentic humanness of Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God. And I would invite you to invite the Son of Man and the Son of God through that door of your heart. Let's pray together. Lord, as we learn about your coming, we know this was from the foundation of the world. And yet at the right time, you sent your son into the world. And so we thank you that you have made a door to our heart. And, and today we want to ask you, Lord Jesus, you, you come through that door. And you, um, you uh, reign supreme in our heart and life, and in our church, we pray. And we pray that we would honor you as the son of man, the son of God. Through Christ we pray. Amen. <laughs>
people, we get free advertising to about 1,600 people about our church and our worship services and all that stuff. So anyway, it'll be fun. Uh, go now in the grace, mercy, and love of the Father, the sacrificial death of the Son, and the cleansing and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.